Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Friday, October 19th, Market Watchers Live Show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, on the surface, things don't look quite so bad. We got the Dow Jones Industrial Average up 163 points, the S&P 500 up 17, the NASDAQ up 34, although it is quite a bit off its earlier high. The Russell 2000, though, is negative today, down a point. 10-year Treasury yield bouncing back, uh, was up over 3.20% yesterday, fell back. Well, we're back up just above 320 again today. It is up three basis points. Volatility index down with the Dow and the S&P 500 rising, but still above the recent lows. We'll continue to watch that. Staples and utilities leading the market to the upside. You can see nice moves here. The XLP trying to break out above the September high, and currently utilities are breaking out above their prior uh, highs, at least on a closing basis. We'll see whether or not that continues into the close. Non-durable uh, household products uh, leading to the upside in terms of the staples. That is a group that's trying to make a breakout uh, from about a month ago. Uh, don't like that long tail up there currently, but if we finish strong today, that would be a very bullish day indeed. Healthcare week, discretionary week. We're going to talk about that in a bit. And the medical equipment group which was one of the leaders. It's part of the healthcare space. It's been one of the leaders uh, turned around just about as it got to that uh, 20 day moving average. And it is moving lower today on an up day. Software not mentioned here, but doing the same thing, really struggling to uh, correct its chart. But we'll talk about all that in a bit. In the meantime, uh, let me bring in my co-host, Aaron. It's Friday. Got any big plans for the weekend? Hey, TGIF. Oh, let me think. Well, I... I don't have any in particular, except for Sunday, we do go to the Ducks game and Paul Correa, number nine, will, his jersey is going to be retired. Uh, we did Timu Solani a couple of years ago, so pretty excited about that. But well, other than that, uh, pretty, pretty calm. <laughs> yeah, how, many, uh, how many games do you get to a year? Uh, well, I have season seats, so I, oh. I go to about 40 something home games. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we're pretty diehard. we're pretty devoted here. <laughs> you are a diehard for sure. Absolutely. Uh, we've got uh, quite a day. I know we've had a lot of ups and downs in the market, but we do have uh, Mary Ellen McGonigal back today to go over the what's hot and what's not for you. Good morning, Mar Mary Ellen. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Good morning to you as well. It's uh, certainly a a landmine out there, but yeah. Uh, and I tell you what, today, the action today, I'll go over it in a minute, but this, the action today scares me more than any other day that we've seen so far, hmm. even though we're green. I'll explain that in a couple of minutes, but um, yeah, I mean, it's been, uh, you know, we were kind of joking beforehand as far as what's hot and what's not. You can probably, you know, put on one hand or two hands what's hot and everything else goes on the other side of the ledger. It seems <sighs> Too true. Yes. Well, actually, there are several bright spots. Well, we we've been able to unturn some rocks and and find them. Okay. Well, yeah. Fair enough. We got everybody's on the edge of their seat now, waiting. You're going to come oh, back good. fifteen <laughs> minutes or so and share that with everybody. So look forward to that. Sounds great. All right, Aaron. We got uh, another busy day ahead. So take it away. All right. Let's do this. Upcoming schedule. We have uh, earnings. Spotlight will have be that uh, we'll have that on Monday with John Hopkins. Everything stock charts is going to be on Tuesday, and Roman Bogomazov will be with us on Wednesday as our special guest. Thursday we have Dan Russo coming back from Chaken Analytics. Today's schedule pretty pretty packed. Uh, as we introduced, Mary Ellen is here for what's hot, what's not. The first symbol in the 10 and 10 is actually going to be Micron technology. That was requested yesterday. And finally, we'll finish up with the sentiment update. I'll let you know what's going out there, going on out there. But I suspect uh, you, you already know how people are feeling. <laughs> so, but we'll talk about what the implications are to all of that. So let's go ahead and technical news and uh, economic reports or report. Yeah, just one out this morning. We did get the September existing home sales out. Uh, another disappointment in home construction and home building area. 5,150,000 units. 
sold versus the expected 5,300,000 units. So just one more uh, awful report for the home construction group, and that has been one negative area for sure. I'll show you that chart in just a second, but before I do, let's take a look at the 10-year treasury yield. You can see the TNX uh, continues to move higher. We did make that breakout. So far, that breakout continues to hold. We're turning up. If there's one negative here, uh, it's that we do have a uh, downtrending PPO at this point. So if we do break out again, it's possible we will start to see a negative divergence. And it's it would come in an area that is somewhat overbought when we look back over the last year in terms of the daily PPO. We have gone up above three on that huge rally that we saw to begin 2018. But other than that, this is a pretty uh, overbought area. In other words, the yield's been rising pretty quickly. So it might not be a bad thing to sideways consolidate for a while. But for now, I would, I would treat the 3.11% uh, area as your key yield support and 3.25 where we hit back with the uh, non-farm payrolls a couple of weeks ago. That would be the area I'd watch to the upside. Now, I do want to show you one other chart, and then we're going to get into the earnings. But let's just take a look quickly at the home construction group and check out this move to the downside. I mean, if we thought it was bad throughout most of 2018, it has really accelerated here in the last four or five weeks. I thought the 720, 725 area was going to be an area where maybe we would get a reversal. I think the market was thinking the same thing because as soon as that level lot was lost, we have been moving straight down. Uh, not even test of the declining 20-day moving average. So this is certainly an area of the market for now that we want to steer clear of. Okay, let's get into those earnings reports because there were a bunch of them, um, and they're picking up. Last night after the bell, PayPal came out. They beat 58 versus 54. You can actually see down this list every one of these. These are all pretty good-sized companies in terms of market capitalization, uh, but all of them beat. So the problem so far with earnings season hasn't been uh, the last quarter's earnings because for the most part, we are seeing uh, corporate America beat again on the bottom line. It's more about what the market is anticipating as we go forward. So we're seeing, in some cases, pretty good results and then a complete reversal in uh, the action. We saw it yesterday with Danaher uh, in that medical equipment space where we gapped up and then completely reversed back down. Uh, but let's take a look at a couple of these uh, charts here and uh, get a feel for what's going on so far today. So let's start with PayPal. PayPal came out. They had really nice results. Uh, they did beat on the top line, $3.68 billion versus $3.66. They beat on the bottom line, as I mentioned, $0.58 versus $0.54. Cents. They raised their fiscal year 18 outlook. Gapped above the 20-day, it was up over $86. You can already see, I don't really like this, the way this uh, candle is beginning to shape up here. Very heavy volume, and we're already a couple of dollars off that earlier high. Let's kind of watch this 20-day moving average. I would not want to see PayPal go back and close below the 20, either today or over the next few days. This was a good report, and uh, so I'd like to see a stock like PayPal, which has been one of the leaders, at least up until October, I'd like to see that uh, PayPal begin to gain strength. If you come out with great earnings and raise forecast and still uh, can't right the ship technically, then I think that's a, a, an issue as we go forward. A couple of other stocks, uh, let's take a look at uh, AXP, American Express, beat top line, beat bottom line. They too guided higher. We are seeing a positive response here in American Express, although no breakout. Still got a little bit of uh, ways to go to the upside for that. But if we could simply get back up above these moving averages, that would be a good thing. ISRG, Intuitive Surgical, this is one that's similar to Danaher yesterday. Um, ISRG beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line. I think that their procedures, uh, there was a percentage that I saw in the after hours yesterday where some medical procedures, they were raising guidance uh, year over year. I think they were looking for a 17% increase instead of 14%. So I thought the report was pretty good. We got a nice gap up. You can see the stock was up almost $20 earlier. Now it's down 15 and threatening a pretty big breakdown. Uh, you've got a 500 low on the stock from about a week and a half ago. We saw this same low at about 500 going back to the end of July after their last earnings report. And then uh, the prior high was up near this 500 level. So I think ISRG is getting close to a pretty big level. And once again, 
You've got a stock that had been doing very well in a very good area of the market, comes out with good news, raises guidance, and goes down. These types of things make me a little bit nervous. CP, Canadian uh, Pacific Railway, they came out beat on the top line. Uh, they missed slightly on the bottom line, and they are trading below that 20-day moving average, and you can see the PPO has moved into negative territory. So we got some issues there. Uh, let's take a look at uh, Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble was, uh, some bright, was a bright spot, I think. Let's see if we can get a close above that prior high close around 85. But Procter & Gamble did report earnings that were better than expected. Top line beat 16.69 billion versus 16.45 billion. They beat on the bottom line a buck 12 versus a buck nine, and they reaffirm their guidance for fiscal year 19. I think the thing that really helps Procter & Gamble is simply being a consumer staple stock because right now the market simply doesn't want anything to do with many of these aggressive stocks that were leading the market. We're seeing money rotate to consumer staples, which I'll talk about in just a second. And that is really one of the things that's bothering me with the market right now. But a couple more charts here. Uh, let's take a look at Honeywell. Honeywell came out and beat. They beat top line, beat bottom line, and the stock gapped up, went down, tested the recent low, has moved off the bottom, but this is another one with PPO weak, failure at the 20-day moving average, Honeywell not looking particularly strong, even though it is up today. And then the last one's Schlumberger, SLB. This one actually beat on the bottom line, but they did come up short with revenues, and you can see just hasn't been a very good year for Schlumberger. Uh, we did get up above the 20-day earlier, but we have reversed. A couple of other charts uh, that I wanted to mention here, SREV. This was a company that warned they lowered their Q3 outlook earlier. And take a look at this relative chart. We've been bringing this up quite a bit, but it's in the business support services group, which has been rising uh, and breaking out into September. But look what the stock the stock's been doing within the space, moving in the opposite direction. So this is a stock that was at a 52 week relative low relative to its peers. It has been declining relative to the S&P 500. So when we get the warning, we shouldn't be shocked. Um, another one that I wanted to mention is OZK. This is in the banking space. Check out Bank of Ozark. It has been declining. Now, granted, the bank index hasn't been particularly strong, but look at Ozark relative to the banks, another stock that is was at its 52-week low. And today, they missed their earnings per share by a mile. They came in at 58 cents. The market was looking for 90 Look at the volume coming in. Now, because it has been off this downtrend and we've got this huge volume and so far a hollow candle, if we could finish with a hollow candle, maybe we have an exhaustive gap. Maybe we'll start to rally again. But let me tell you the two things that really bother me about this market right now. First of all, today we were rallying. We were trying and, and uh, you know, trying to, to right the ship, but look at what's leading. XLP having a really nice day trying to break out. XLY, on the other hand, which is the other end of consumer discretionary, look at what's happening here in October. And even on a good day like today, we are seeing the XLY go down while the XLP is going higher. So folks just don't want anything to do with these aggressive stocks. Furthermore, let's take a look at the Dow Jones Utilities, dollar UTIL. Here is a triple top breakout. Utilities trying to lead the market to the upside. What are the transports doing today? This is the flip side of that equation I like to look at. Well, we're almost at a six-month low, barely up today with the market rising. These are the things that worry me. It's not so much about when we go down, because I do expect defensive groups to lead when we're heading lower. But the problem is when we start to rally and defensive areas are leading these rally attempts, they are destined to fail, in my opinion. So we need to change some things here, or I would be uh, expecting at least a test of the lows that we saw a week or so ago, a week and a half ago. All right, Aaron, there's a number of upgrades, downgrades. What do you have for us today? All right, let's get started. Three upgrades, three downgrades, make it even. <laughs> we'll start with the upgrades. Let's start with Disney. Uh, Disney was upgraded today by Barclays from an equal weight to overweight. Investors seem to be pretty happy about this. Uh, we got a nice breakout currently trading above overhead resistance that we'd seen about 118. And look at this, the PMO has now turned back up and has a buy signal. So I think this one is set up pretty nicely. 
I, I like seeing that buy signal on the breakout. We're still pretty close to that breakout level. So I, I think there is some potential here to the upside. Uh, if we look at the weekly, I'll just give you a peek at that one. Yeah, you can see we've got all-time highs. Uh, looks like we've hit all-time highs right now on Disney, at least since uh, 2012. So it looks like it's ready to pop even further. Uh, Nevro Corp was, uh, excuse me, that was, yeah, Roku. Roku was upgraded today by RBC Capital uh, from a sector perform to an outperform. And I've marked this one up. You know, I'm not really thrilled with the action. Of course, it's down 3% today. The PMO is about ready to hit negative territory. I'd be really careful with this one. We are coming down to gap support here as well as overhead, you know, what was uh, overhead resistance back here. You can see the tops from July and February and back in November. <clears throat> All of those line up, that should be a very strong area of support. So if we fall down below that, uh, if we fall even further down below that 200 day EMA, I just, this is not looking too good. I would like to see uh, support hit and then bounced off of before I would get involved with Roku. Uh, X-Ray was also upgraded today. I've mislabeled it up there, but Goldman has upgraded it from a sell straight up to a buy. No neutral, we're just going straight to a buy on X-Ray. And I've got the PMO buy signal. We hit some uh, support down here. Well, we, we created some support here earlier in October and we are starting to head back up. Uh, we've managed to get above the 20 day EMA. I think that's positive, but we do have overhead resistance looming at about $40. And then past that is where we have that gap resistance level. If this uh, upgrade is uh, as good as uh, it's lined up to be, uh, we should expect it to, to pop on through and close that gap eventually. But you know, with the market the way it is, uh, um, I, I think you could make that uh, make a play for going up to that $40, 40 $41 area, uh, because I think we're definitely gonna get up to that area. You can even see the, the short-term declining trend has been broken. All right downgrades today, BIIB, Biogen, was downgraded today by Bernstein uh, from an outperform to a market perform. Uh, I've got the PMO logging in a sell signal, it looks like by the end of the day for uh, on the weekly chart. So that's an intermediate term PMO. That's not the short term PMO, that's the intermediate term PMO and it is gonna log a, a sell signal today. Uh, I don't like the look of Biogen. Uh, you know, we've hit the 50-day, uh, well, I'm sorry, the 43-week EMA. I mean, there's an opportunity for a bounce here, uh, but that, that PMO, I think, just tells the story right there. Also downgraded today was eBay. Stifle downgraded from a buy to a hold. I do not like eBay. Um, I have not liked eBay uh, for quite a while, and you can see one of the reasons it's been uh, the momentum, the PMO has been in negative territory pretty much all the way through May as we've gone down this uh, decline. Uh, I would look at a weekly chart just to see how much damage we're looking at over this week in particular. We're getting ready to hit that $28, $27 level, which was the last area I would say of support uh, back here from 2016. Uh, but right now we're hitting lows we have not seen uh, since early uh, 2017, well, actually since 2016. So uh, eBay seems to be in a little bit of a, a pinch right now. I know that they are in the process, I think, of um, a, um, a lawsuit against Amazon. So uh, I think they're just looking for ways to increase uh, their their uh, profitability here, but not looking so good. Uh, we've got uh, NVRO, Nevro Corp, was also downgraded today by Goldman from a neutral to a sell. We're getting ready to hit some interesting support here, uh, but I don't like that PMO, uh, so I, I likely would stay away from this. I mean, if you wanna try and bottom fish here, you could, but that negative configuration of all those EMAs, uh, I don't like it. So just to make it simple. So uh, just uh, in other news, other big name upgrades, uh, Marathon Oil, Murphy Oil, PayPal, and Werner all were upgraded today. Uh, other downgrades that I didn't look at, Harley uh, Hog was downgraded. Ford 
was downgraded. Travelers, TRV, was downgraded. And Valero, VLO, was also downgraded today. And that's all I have. Let's go ahead and bring back Mary Ellen. How are you doing? You, you ready to get started on what's hot and what's not? Oh, you bet. Yes. And I think I'm going to surprise everyone with a fair number of bright spots out there. So uh, help you go into your weekend in a better mood. But uh, <laughs> that, that doesn't mean we can ignore the reality of, uh, as Tom said, some of these faster growing stocks that are continuing to get hit. And I'm hoping you can see my screen here. Uh, not yet. Okay, we'll, we'll get that going. And here we go. You know, what's interesting, uh, Mary Ellen, I think you're gonna touch on this, but some of these stocks that we see that are hot one week, the next week, they just kind of fall apart. So hard to, to really put a lot of stock, you know, no pun intended, but uh, <laughs> hard to put a lot of stock in some of these uh, hot stocks when you've got a market that, you know, is so volatile right now. You're right. There is one area of continuity. And I think uh, with that, I can jump right into an area as far as what is hot. And that is the healthcare sector. And when we look at healthcare, this is something that I have written about on uh, stockcharts.com on their blog, as well as uh, talked about, touched upon it on my weekly MEM Edge show. And within healthcare, what you'll find is there is not only a growth aspect that is still being supported. Uh, healthcare by and large is a defensive sector. And the prominent reason there, of course, is because regardless of what occurs in the economy, tariff fears, uh, higher interest rates, uh, humans, we are still going to need our, our health care and um, people are willing to pay up. But outside of that, too, there is a lot of outstanding activity going on in the way of innovative new products that uh, are being developed and they're helping to expand uh, life expand lifespans and also uh, reduce recovery times. So this healthcare area really is a standout uh, area within the broader market. So we can take a look here. We're looking at the one week view of the subgroupings within healthcare. And right away, you can see that these pharmaceutical stocks are up two and a half percent this week. So we're going to cover some of these pharmas, take a look. Uh, what we can do from here, of course, with stock charts is then go ahead and see what really is uh, working. But I'm going to go ahead and sort it by that scooter. And right immediately up front, you'll see, again, a lot of these pharmas. So let's go ahead and take a look at Pfizer. This is a company that has been really outstanding within pharmaceuticals. And you can see that it did, we're looking at a daily chart. So a little over a week ago, the stock price did hit a new high pulled back to its 50 day simple moving average. This is that red line, but more recently it is finding uh, buyers and it's back up above that shorter term 10 day simple moving average, really pretty much ignoring what's going on around it. And there are very sound reasons for that. Uh, Pfizer got FDA approval for a breast cancer drug this week. And the company also came out and announced that they're gonna be reducing their workforce by 10%. And analysts, of course, like that. Uh, Pfizer does still have a number of other very prominently uh, expected drugs in their pipeline. So the uh, growth prospects remain quite sound for this company. J&J uh, &J is another one, Johnson & Johnson. And this is one, uh, it fell quite a bit harder as far as breaking below that 50 day. But this week we are seeing the stock rally and they came out with earnings, very strong earnings. Uh, they jumped 4.2% on that earnings and they are now flat on the day. Uh, they came in well above estimates and uh, among other things, J&J &J does have a corporate venture arm and they are investing in ways to help uh, with Alzheimer's and uncover drugs there. So that's quite a bright spot. And then UNH, this is not a pharma stock, of course, this is a um, healthcare managed care. This is a company that also came out with very strong numbers this week. Analysts are raising estimates. The company announced very, very strong 
organic membership growth. And so, of course, the market is rewarding that. We can look at another area within healthcare that's not normally viewed as defensive, and that's biotechs. The, uh, this is BIB. Now, of course, this is not a pretty chart by any means, but uh, biotech stocks are actually finding uh, traction. There are over 500 biotech stocks in the broader market, but over 125 of them are rallying this week. And what I wanted to do here is take you to the sector chart. And you'll be able to see within these biotechs that a lot of these biotechs really come on super strong. They have these huge rallies. And as an investor, I will tell you that it is not an easy dynamic to get in front of because a lot of these companies don't have earnings, these biotechs. And so when you are screening for stocks, of course, you want those that are very sound fundamentally. Uh, let's just take a quick peek here. We're looking at an intraday. But what I'd like to do is take a look at the weekly performance. And even on an intraday basis, you'll see this pretty much every day, these huge double-digit moves in these uh, biotechs. And a lot of it is uh, not, they're companies that are being funded, but they are not earning any kind of money. So we can see double digit growth there. Biotech stocks, of course, are not defensive. They are quite risky in nature. But just to give you an example, here's a company that was up a biotech company this week, KZR. But the company is losing a lot of money, but you can see that it looks very sound and positive. The reason it was up this week is because they had tr uh, very uh, preclinical trials with mice on autoimmune uh, lupus related. The stock's up 11%. So that kind of thing is happening all over within biotechs. But again, it's hard to embrace. From my work, I would be more inclined to take a look at a more sound company within these biotechs. This is uh, NBIX. And you can see the stock is held in really quite well. <clears throat> and this company, the growth prospects are 956% earnings growth for 2019. They do a lot with neurological disorders and they're backed by ABV, ABBV. They have a lot going on in their pipeline. So for those of you that would be inclined to look at biotechs, uh, I certainly would steer you more toward uh, these sounder companies. And then also within uh, healthcare medical products, and I know Tom talked about it because that's a group that year to date going into this week, they were up quite a bit. It uh, has a lot of high growth companies in there. They are getting hit, but there are a couple of stocks within medical products that bear taking a look at. And this is a smaller company. It's Glaucos and it's <clears throat> GKOS. And you can see this big move up here. We're looking at a weekly chart. So this is taking us to that last week in August, the company, uh, the stock jumped 40%. The reason there is because one of the their competitors that also provides uh, surgery devices for glaucoma surgeries, they exited the market. So it really opened the space for GKOS. What I like about it is it pulled back very nicely to its 10 day simple moving average, which is in an uptrend. Growth prospects are quite big going forward for that one. CDNA is another smaller healthcare stock, and then we can move on to other areas. But this is a uh, transplant specialist. Let's see if I can get that ticker symbol in there so we can take a quick look at it, CDNA. And the uh, this is another one that is finding support at an upward trending 10-day simple moving average, pretty much ignoring what is happening around it. And they had big earnings back in August. And you can see that analysts have been continuing to revise estimates higher as the stock continues to advance. Management came out back in August and guided higher going forward. So there are certainly bright spots. Again, that is within healthcare. But let's go ahead and move on to other areas that are certainly defensive. And we can talk about a lot of the food, food products, stocks that are up this week, Procter and Gamble, of course, had a big day today on big earnings. But there are other areas within the consumer staples, and we're looking at this via this uh, sector summary here. And uh, 
let's go ahead and take a weekly view so we can see as far as the broader week goes. And there is quite a bit of vibrancy of food products, soft drinks, drug retailers. And of course, a lot of these are going to be defensive. Uh, the food retailers are coming in strong as well. So I wanted to focus you on two in particular that are smaller regional retailers, but they're very similar in their nature as far as what they look at. Uh, the first one is SFM, this is Sprouts. And this is a regional supermarket. You can see that this company had a very, very strong uptrend here going into September more recently has pulled back very orderly to its upward trending 50 day simple moving average. The RSI is positive. Your MACD is poised to have that positive crossover, that black line up through the red. And the, this is a company that provides a lot. It's, I would call it a, a, a whole foods for the everyman in the sense that they offer quite a bit in the way of organic products, but they are not as highly priced. They, they come in at a very, very reasonable price point. But the difference here with Sprouts is also they do a lot in the way of vitamins and lotions. So if you go into their stores, the very first half is devoted to that. And then they go on from there to uh, food products. So uh, the company is expanding and the yeah, analysts are rising estimates for this company. And this is another uh, company where we are seeing, as I talked about, growth through expansion. There is another uh, wholesaler or actually food retailer that is very, very similar in nature, NGVC. And it's called Natural Gro Grocers Vitamin Cottage. And this stock you can see is also holding up remarkably well. We're looking at a daily chart. The RSI is trending positively. Your MACD had that positive crossover and is poised to come up again above that net uh, neutral into positive territory. It's a smaller company, about 300 million in market cap. Uh, NV, NGVC is again, very, very similar. They offer organic foods. They offer high margin vitamin products, but they are focused primarily now in the Colorado, Oregon area. But this is another company that is growing by opening new stores, organic growth. Both companies are viewed as possible takeover targets. So in reviewing them, that did come up. One last one that we can take a look at before we need to move on is MK. C. And this is, of course, McCormick, a food product. And take a look at that uptrend here. You really would not know what was going on within the broader markets just by taking a look at that. Your RSI is positive. Your MACD is very much in positive territory. Their sales over the first three quarters of 2018 are up 18%. And a lot of that has to do is with the expansion of their brand portfolio. They picked up a uh, French's, Frank's, uh, recently acquired. These are condiment companies and they really helped lift the gross profit margins to a new high for the company. And also we're seeing a big improvement in their cash flow. So MKC is uh, very, very interesting. So uh, lastly, I will mention briefly that we are seeing a couple of airlines, UAL came out with strong earnings this week. And a lot of that has to do with higher ticket prices. People are paying higher. They're also segmenting their cab their cabin so that if you want overhead, you're going to have to pay for it. If you want more leg room, you're going to have to pay for it. And consumers are. So the stock is moving up. SAVE is another airline that is up for the week. Also a very budget oriented pay for everything, uh, including the air. You can see how that one is, is, uh, picking up and then Delta Airlines. And then lastly, a couple of bright spots within the restaurant. Restaurant stocks are up two and a half percent this week. I think uh, given what's going on in the markets, people are going out to eat. NDLS is a stock that we pointed out to you last week, and you can see it's continuing to do well. They have a new product line for low carb. It's called Zoodles. Analysts like it. They've upgraded it. Uh, Starbucks, we can't leave without taking a look at that because it's a well-known larger company in the 
space and take a look at the updraft here. They've had come out with a number of announcements. They've had a change in their leadership. They're restructuring in Europe, closing stores. And then they're also just penned a licensing deal in Mexico. So uh, without further ado, I can go ahead and move on to what's not hot. So we are certainly uh, robust with any number of areas that are not seeing a lot in the way of an uptrend. Let's go ahead again to this sector summary. And certainly one of the first areas that we can point to as far as what's not hot is the energy. Take a look, energy sector is down one and a half percent on the week. And that has everything to do with oil prices. And so let's take a look at USO as a gauge. And you can see this downdraft here. So oil pricing is now at a one month low and energy companies do not like that. Uh, and as Tom mentioned a couple of weeks ago, it was all about energy stocks because as you can see back here, energy was hitting a oil pricing was hitting a four year high. So the most impacted from oil pricing directly is going to be the E&P, the exploration and production. So again, these are the same guys that were really standouts about two weeks ago, but unfortunately this week they are seeing selling. We can look at EOG as a prime example, take a look at this gap down and continued downtrend. NFX is another one. I mean, we could just go on and on, but those once hot oil stocks are now getting hit. And then of course, when you see a downdraft or uh, there's gonna be other areas that are gonna be also uh, not doing well. We're seeing transportation stocks that are getting hit this week. This week. Tom talked about rail stocks, CSX came out, but uh, they're their earnings were ignored, the stock is down. But a lot of these trucking stocks are going down as well. ODFL is certainly one of many that is caught in quite a downdraft, ARCB. And this is a bit concerning. And I know Tom's talked about some spots that are a little unnerving. When we see these transportation stocks getting hit, particularly in the face of good numbers. I can tell you with ODFL, the outlook is quite promising. Analysts like the stock fundamentally, but uh, these transportation stocks are going to be really tied into economic growth. I know that uh, consumer cyclicals is another area that we can spend a bit of time looking at because- Mary Ellen? Oh, you, yes, of course. I, I just wanted to interject here for a second. I don't know if you can go up to the top and uh, next to the sharp chart, just go ahead and enter dollar sign WTIC. Sure. Uh, well, change the seasonality from sharp, sharp chart to seasonality at the top in the middle. Sorry. Yeah, right where it says sharp chart next to where you enter the symbol. You're almost there, up a little higher. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. Well, you can put do dollar sign WTIC in there, but yeah, change that to the sentiment. Um, and I, I just think this will, this is somewhat interesting and I don't have an, an uh, explanation for it, but yeah, if you go ahead and click on that and then go down to the bottom, this is a five year, but if you see that little slider at the bottom under the charts, it has the number five on it. Mm -hmm. If you can just grab the left side of that little rectangular box over further to the, yeah. And then just grab that and drag it. Yep. Drag it all the way back 20 years. What is kind of interesting, and I don't have an explanation, but look at October, November, and December. Historically, crude oil prices drop in October, November, and December. And if you look across there, October and November are clearly the two worst months. Mm. And so we're, we're seeing crude oil drop again, which historically it normally you know, does this during October. I, you know, And that's definitely have an impact, obviously, on a lot of these uh, energy shares. But I can't think of anything fundamentally. Do you, can you think of anything why oil prices would struggle in October and November? I, I cannot. I mean, of course, it is supply and demand driven. And more recently, we've had a lot of geopolitical tension in Iran that has pr uh, decreased production. And then, of course, you have OPEC that is r ruling to keep production low. So there's, as far as that, not, I, I 
can't. I mean, you wouldn't think that that would be calendar based, though, you know. Right. I, I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you think of oil, maybe heating oil and October might not see a lot of demand, but that's not the dynamic. We're talking about oil as in fracking and deep sea oil exploration. So I, I'm, I'm baffled, but you know, I'm going to look that up after this. If you ever <laughs> and, come up with an explanation, I would love to hear it because I, I can't figure it out either, but I just wanted to mention it because it, it was, if you go back and you look at the XLE or you look at any, you know, the USO, any of those, mm -hmm. charts, it was literally like the beginning of October, all of a sudden, we just kind of fell apart. I, I thought it was interesting. Fall off the cliff and for 20 years too. I mean, that's that's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah, but uh, I guess the good news is if you're in energy is once we get past the fourth quarter, uh, the first four or five months, six months actually, first half of the year, mm -hmm. and to see oil prices rise, whereas the second half of the year, not so much. Very interesting. Thanks. That yeah. was... I don't know if it means anything. I just want to point it out. No, that was, I'm sure it does because we've already identified the clear cut uh, synergy between the actual price of oil and those oil stocks. Now I will say within energy without getting too into it, there are areas that are bucking this. Uh, I, exploration production stocks are gonna be the most fully impacted, but there are still some pipeline stocks. There are still areas within energy that are holding up uh, for those of you that care to indulge and broaden out your portfolios uh, with an eye toward the beginning of next year. Um, super, so we can also uh, take a look. We were mentioning earlier how consumer discretionary stocks are just by and large getting hit. Uh, I talked about restaurants and a couple of bright spots, but this is the XLY, the sector ETF for consumer discretionary stocks. And you can see that they've gotten hit. Consumer discretionary stocks really fell apart prior to the broader markets. This was the end of September. We started to see these stocks break down and uh, very concerning because this was a leadership group within the broader markets. Uh, computer software, consumer discretionary were holding up well, even during the corrective phase in the beginning of this year. So this type of breakdown, this loss of leadership is not what you want to see, of course. And there are certainly areas within consumer discretionary that are getting hit a little harder than others. And Tom talked about earlier construction related stocks, uh, this will tie in because what we've seen is a slowdown in new home sales and new home construction. We had two down periods and then in August, we did get a little bit of a blip up, but analysts are resoundingly saying that the housing slowdown is here to stay. So anything construction related. So with that in mind, you will see some of these home furnishing stocks getting hit. We can take a look at Home Depot. You'll see the real severe downdraft that this stock is having. Analysts are saying that, uh, again, not only home furnishings, but of course, home building related are going to get hit. LOW, Lowe's is another. This is these are both consumer discretionary stocks that are in very clear cut downtrends. They've broken key support. Their RSI is trending downward. To get a better feel, you can even go to a weekly chart and that will also support the RSI is just poised to turn negative and the MACD had that mega negative uh, crossover. And then of course, outside of that, we can take a look at uh, autos are down, that these have been down for some time. Uh, this is General Motors. And then uh, department stores are getting hit. Uh, and a lot of these have certainly struggled, but they are uh, getting hit this week. We can also look at some of the uh, jewelry stocks. This is Fossil, a watch company. And I think the daily will show this even more pronounced as far as the recent downtrend that we've seen. Uh, Tiffany, of course, is one of the better known within these jewelers. And you can see the break down below these key simple moving averages breaks the 50. Once we break the 200 day simple moving average, you're really confirming that downtrend. You want to take a look at the volume when it breaks on big volume, more downside ahead. So as the these key moving averages now 
trend downward. Instead of acting as support as they do on the upside back here, we can see support. These downward trending simple moving averages are now going to act as resistance. So any kind of rally attempts, they're going to be hit. So this is going to continue as these simple moving averages trend downward. I'm telling you for any other stocks that you might own that have broken key support, what you're going to want to look out for. And then we can also look at shoe and apparel related. And all of these were super, super strong going into the summer months. And this is Steve Madden, S-H-O-O. -O. You can see really how strong the stock was. This this is February, March, April. The broader markets were still recovering from the correction, but these types of stocks really were just gangbusters. But this is taking us into the end of September. They are all coming under distribution. These retailers and consumer discretionary stocks are the last to report earnings. So they're not going to be reporting for another two months. Uh, as far as whether this is indicative of the upcoming uh, season, as far as the uh, shopping season into the year end, uh, it's really going to be quite telling to see if these stocks are going to be able to rebound. Uh, software stocks, another super strong area. Again, earlier in the year, we can look at a uh, ETF, IGV, which is the uh, software ETF, and you can see it had its blips, but by and large, there was a very firm uptrend in place. This is another area that the, on average, software stocks were up about 40% going into the end of September. It was the first area to crack as far as showing former leadership breaking, stocks breaking down. Uh, this week, we did see some rally attempts in software stocks, but many of them were rather anemic. Uh, Adobe would stand out where it had this big, nice move on Tuesday, but now it's giving it back. Uh, CRM, these are both former big leadership names within software, but they're getting hit. And this is really another area of concern. I think Tom drew you into that, where these former growth names, leadership stocks are coming under distribution. It's not what you like to see. ATVI is a gaming stock, another formerly super strong area. And you can see where they are getting hit. So the RSI trending negative, breaking down below below these key simple moving averages. Take a look at this break below the 200 day and the volume there is just off the grid. That volume is telling you that institutions are exiting and once they begin to exit, it takes a while for them to wind down their big positions. So I would expect to see a continued downtrend in ATVI and others. Uh, other areas within technology that are continuing to get hit. Let's take a look at the semiconductor. And of course, this is an area that has been really quite a bumpy ride going into the summer months all over the place. There's been a lot of talk of trade war, tariff-related angst. But really, this more recent break, again, down this through below that 200-day simple moving average, take a look at this pickup here in the volume. And again, that is indicating that this is a group that is truly out of favor. Uh, semiconductor stocks are, of course, cyclical. Uh, we can, of course, drill down and take a look at some individual stocks within semiconductors. This is Intel. They've had their share of issues as far as uh, chip production problems, uh, the loss of their CEO due to a scandal, but uh, the stock really has just not been able to rebound. And one other thing to bear in mind, let's take a look at XLK. This is the ETF for technology, and you can see how it's pretty much fallen off a cliff after being a leadership space pretty much throughout the year, more recently coming under quite a bit of distribution. There's been a shift within the technology sector as far as the holdings because of the new communications services sector. It stole a couple of the bigger Googles and uh, Facebooks. But uh, so now Apple is now 20% of the technology sector. So when you talk about tech, you are going to want to include Apple, which is actually holding in surprisingly well. Another big 
uh, MSFT is a big area for the uh, technology sector as far as 17% uh, of the sector is Microsoft. That's also holding up well. But one last area before I sign off, uh, I feel that we cannot uh, leave without talking again about some of the uh, marijuana related, cannabis related stocks. Canada did come out this week and as expected, they legalized uh, recreational marijuana. And so we did see a little bit of a pop in those stocks, but of course, much of the moves were made going into the legislative, uh, into the uh, agreement to do that. But this is CRON and the stock is, uh, this is that pop earlier this week, but the stock is still finding support at an upward trending 50 day simple moving average. And there are certainly other names that you can keep an eye on. Tilray, T-L-R-Y, another one finding support at an upward trending 10 day simple moving average. So there's a sense that these stocks are holding in well. And so I would potentially uh, keep them on your radar screen because at some point they are going to uh, eventually see positive benefits from the expanded ability for consumers to uh, take part in their products. So guys, I think uh, I'm going to leave it at that. I can continue on because we've seen banks, bank stocks, uh, a couple of those that are rallying, but we can save that for, for next week. Yeah, that uh, there's a lot to go over, um, especially with the volatility that we've seen. You know, we've seen some of the money rotating back to some of these uh, less aggressive areas of the market, like uh, mm -hmm. utilities, consumer staples, and some of the stocks that you pointed out. And then we also see money rotating away from many of those aggressive areas that we've been just used to waking up every day, seeing leadership from, and all of a yeah. sudden not. And you even mentioned computer hardware, and that's an area of the market that's held up pretty well. But even mm -hmm. I'm even looking at that space, the DJUSCR, which is the index for computer hardware, and that's below the 20 day and the 50 day moving average. And it's going back up. It's testing them. It can't get through. And yeah, um, that's IBM is, is a big one in there that's just suffering. Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, you've got Apple, which is held up, I think, on a relative basis. I think just about everybody would agree it's held up very well. Um, but you've got others like you mentioned, Microsoft, some of you know, Adobe. Mm -hmm. Nobody really surprised me. I mean, they raised their revenue guidance. Stock responded very well just a few days ago. And then all of a sudden, like you said, it's uh, it's given it all back. And yeah, it's and the dis disconcerting part for me is a lot of my work. I'm looking at I want to see companies that are high quality, very fundamentally sound. And the estimates for these companies are really robust. Analysts have continued to raise estimates going into earnings season. And the fact that the markets are looking the other way is not healthy. So, yeah. yeah and I, I mean, another stock in that computer hardware space that had been a leader for quite some time was Network Appliance, NTAP. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that one in the first two weeks or week and a half of October fell from $86 down to 74. And when it rallied with the overall market last week, literally it went right up to the 20 day moving average failed and is now starting to roll back over again. So a lot of these companies are just not acting bullish on their charts, technically. The exactly, yeah. And it's, it's uh, again, very disconcerting having studied the markets for so many years when you see that leadership fade. And now this, this week, we are seeing that defensive move. I didn't talk about it, but a lot of REIT stocks are up. Uh, for a while, we were seeing lackluster in the former growth, but no move into defensive. Now, this week, we are seeing that. So it could be confirming this rotation, uh, unfortunately, out of those growth into more defensive areas. Yep. And that always bothers me. I mean, I don't, when the market's going down, it doesn't bother me that money's rotating to defense because that's normally what happens. Defense mm -hmm. mm -hmm. do take on more money. Everyone gets afraid. They get rid of those, uh, you know, they move away from some of those more aggressive high growth areas and into defensive areas. But when the market rallies, my experience has been, you don't want to see the market rallying and trying to reestablish bullish technical conditions with leadership from some of the defensive areas. And unfortunately, that's what we were seeing earlier today. And that really bothered me when I saw the Dow or the NASDAQ even up close to 100. I think it was up 90 earlier. The Dow was up a couple hundred or two, 250. 
And then I looked at the leadership and I saw consumer staples and utilities up near the top. It's like, okay, this yeah. is not good. Yeah, your, your, your heart drops. The other yeah. dynamic yeah. too that is very indicative of a weak market is when you talked about this earlier, when companies are coming in with strong earnings well ahead of estimates and by and large, it's they're not being rewarded. Mm -hmm. That's uh, another typical signal of a very weak market. Yeah, and I'm not going to throw the bear word out there yet because I'm not no. bearish. <laughs> but, Sorry, I have to laugh at that one. <laughs> yeah, don't you dare. <laughs> no, but I am. I'm very cautious right now, and I think the way the market's setting up, I think it's very similar to what we had in 2015, 2016. I don't. Yes. I don't know if you followed that, but that first. Very familiar drop, with that period. That, that first initial drop we had in 2015. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, let me go ahead and I'm going to pull it. That chart. was in the fall. In fact, I was doing a lot of writing for thestreet.com and I did a number of articles about that. That fall, the fall period where we did have that drop and then into December we had that attempted rally and then good night in, in January of 2016. Yep. So, uh, and, and I, I agree with you. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, when we went sideways, this this right here, going sideways and then moving up to slightly higher highs, kind of looks like what we saw back in August and September of 2015. We came all the way back up. I mean, we did it a lot faster back then, mm -hmm. but we went all the way back up to where we had fallen. And right. then we came back down. We actually put in a slightly lower low, and then we took back off again. And I th I think we actually had one low that was in even earlier than that. I'm going to go back just a little further. But I remember that rally in December 15, and it was super narrow. It, it just uh, didn't feel particularly healthy. And yep. when you really think about the recovery from that 16 correction uh, on that chart, it looks pretty swift, but uh, I feel like it, it took a while. Yeah, here is the, this was the one I was thinking of. This was October of 2014 where we took the first initial plunge. I mean, we had been trending higher and this was kind of scary because it took us back to multi-month lows. And then we we kind of, we came right back up, went through it and kind of staggered for several months. And then when we, when we started to go through this these gyrations, I remember the volatility index jumped. And simply what we did is went sideways and kind of tested that low. And uh, you know, when you look back, it's more of rectangular consolidation after an uptrend, which ended up breaking to the upside. So I'm not ready to throw the towel in yet on the market. I think that, uh, you know, because we did have such a big rally up, heading up into 2018, we did pull back initially and made our way back up. I think we could, if we don't hold on to last week's lows, I think we could go back down to the January, February lows. Mm -hmm. and Retest. That, that is going to be the key area for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll to, see. to find support, you bet. Yep. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, it was very... Uh, uh, great having you on here again. I mean, we've of been course. on here on Fridays. There's so much going on in the market. So thanks so much for stopping by and helping us uh, keep track of it all. Oh, of course. Have a great weekend. All right. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Take care. Okay, Aaron, uh, 10 and 10, you ready to go? I am ready to go. And I'll tell you what, people were really paying attention to what Mary Ellen had to say, because check it out. I had 18 symbol requests. I usually get about 30 to 40. So um, good job, Mary Ellen. Everybody wanted to hear what you had to say. Uh, interesting today, healthcare we know has been very strong. So interesting to see that leading. Uh, not that interesting. I mean, it's kind of expected. Uh, co communication services, though, we got four in that area. So I thought that was interesting. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started with Micron. All right. Going to have to have another lightning round here. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the other thing I would say maybe about the less questions is maybe there's a lot less trading going on, which I hope is the case because the market's so volatile. But anyway, let's take a look at Micron. You know, Micron on the surface, it's been trending lower. I'd be really careful on the sh from the short term. Longer term, I'm not sure this, this uptrend is over yet, even though it has been a very, very significant move to the downside. Don't lose sight in the fact that Micron went from a $27 stock in August to a $63 stock in March. Uh, that's about six, eight months, and the stock went up well over 100%, probably about 130%. Um, so double top, working our way back down. We took out this prior low that you can see here, but in a uptrend, you have higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, and we have not taken out that low. I think the 37 level is critical for Micron from a longer term perspective. So after all this washouts over, if we can hold 37 and a half and come back up 
get back through that 20 day moving average. I'm not sure the rally is over in Micron, but I wouldn't be touching it yet. I want to be really careful with the market, the way it's set up. All right. Excellent. Uh, let's see. The most popular in the chat room happens to be something I'll be talking about a little bit in the sentiment program. But what are what is your uh, expectations for gold, GLD? Um, you know, it still depends on the dollar. Right now, I'm, I'm bullish gold in the short term. Intermediate term, not so much. Long term, not at all. Um, I think the dollar goes higher. So I think eventually this will come to an end. But for now, given as weak as the market is and money rotating into safety and, and a hedge like gold, I'm okay with it on the, from a short-term perspective. To the downside, what I would watch, I think we had a nice breakout. As you can see, we had gap resistance, price resistance, right at about 115. We broke out above that. I would probably watch the top of gap support here around 114 and use that as my stop to the downside. If you break that, you're breaking the 20-day moving average. And in a uh, an area of the market like this that's been downtrending for years, I don't want to see a break of that short-term rising 20-day moving average. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's do uh, Discovery uh, Incorporated, but we're going to do the one that is D-I-S-C-K. All right. Um, well, sideways consolidation. I think this is a really nice looking chart given the overall market conditions. What I would be watching is that uh, breakout level right at about 27 and a half. The recent highs up near 31. I think you're in a trading range right now. But despite everything that's going on, you've still got an uptrend in play. You've got the PPO above the center line. Can't say that for many stocks right now. So DISCK looks pretty good on a relative basis. Okay. Next one up, uh, PayPal. Yeah, PayPal, I mentioned a little bit earlier in the show, they did report earnings last night after the bell. Good earnings, but you can see after getting up above 86, we continue to drift lower now down to 83.66. Very heavy volume. And I have seen a number of companies that have broken down like PayPal only to get up and test the 20 or maybe move just a little bit above and then fail. So what I would be keeping a very close eye on is that rising, uh, well, what's just starting to become a rising 20-day moving average. If we fail, I mean, they, they beat top line, they beat bottom line, they raise guidance. If they can't hold their 20-day moving average on this pullback, I would be waiting for another bottom. And it could be the recent low down around 75, or it could be all the way back down at the low we saw in early May down around 70. Uh, but if the market continues to weaken and we see that volatility pick up, remember, uh, technical support levels don't really do a whole lot. And I wouldn't be surprised to see us all the way back down to that May low. So I'd be careful. All right. Now, this is one I know we've never looked at. I'm just sure of it, but you can tell me if I'm wrong. It's the Sugar Sub Index Total Return. Uh, S G G F F. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've not looked at that one. <laughs> um, yeah, you just, wouldn't have known that symbol by heart. No, I would not. And I was waiting for you to, to give it to me. I didn't know that one. <laughs> um, here you can see the uh, overhead resistance, which was established back at the beginning of June. Major top right there with that bearish engulfing candle kept going down. We're in an uptrend. So I think as long as we remain in the uptrend, I'd keep watching that rising 20 day moving average, but uh, I would also respect this resistance area around 2575. So if I was in it from a short term perspective, it's overbought, we're nearing resistance, I would take the money and run. But uh, I guess to each his or her own. Yes. <laughs> this one makes me want to go out shopping. Shoe Carnival, SCVL. Yeah, I think this was your setup for this week. Yes, uh, I believe so. Yeah. Well, it's uh, doing well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's holding up pretty well, considering. Uh, I know that there are others in this space that are not holding up nearly as well. Um, it's, uh, I, I would probably watch these moving averages. I don't want to take it back down to the recent low at 36. Uh, but it, there's the support area. You can see there was gap support at about 37. Recent lows around 36. So I view this to be pretty significant support to the downside. But if it fails to hold the moving averages, it could uh, wind up back down in that area. Ultimately, what you're looking for is a target back up near the high in late August, just above 44. All right. Let's see. Next one up is Array Biopharma, A-R-R-Y. All right. 
Um, well, I think it's pretty clear where the key resistance lies. Uh, over the last three or four months, we have come up multiple times trying to get through about 1575. I don't like yesterday's candle. Heavy volume. We had the breakout and we failed. That normally leads to a short term pullback. So I am expecting today's weakness to continue. And I would be watching the rising 20 day moving average. If we're truly in an uptrend here and going to break out, we should hold that 20 day on a pullback. You can see the past few months that the 20 day really hasn't mattered because we don't really have a trend in play, but a breakout here would be very bullish. So watch 1575 to the upside and about 1450 downside. All right. Next one is from materials, Cliffs Natural Resources. It's uh, steel, CLF. Yep. Just reported earnings. And I tell you, I had on Zach's, this is one that was kind of weird um, because on Zach's it showed that it was that they missed their earnings, 64 cents versus 66. And then I was going through briefing.com and they showed that they beat buck 41 versus 66. So they at least both had the estimate the same. I'm going to go along with uh, Zach's though. It looks to me like they probably missed in order to have this kind of a candle. I think they've, if they have reported earnings of a buck 41 versus 66 cents, I don't think the stock would be down 5% right now. They also initiated a 20 cent quarterly dividend, by the way. So you're talking about 80 cents, which if I do the math real quick, it's probably about seven and a half, seven and three quarter percent dividend, unless I've done something wrong or read something wrong. So that's a pretty good dividend. But with all of that, you can see the stock got sold off. I think it may come back up and hold the 50 day though. This has been one of the better stocks in the market. Um, I would, uh, Let's see where it closes today and then go from there. But I would probably just be watching. I'm going to annotate here. Uh, probably want to keep a close eye on this 50 day moving average right here, because if you look down below, you'll see volume is very, very heavy today. All right. Let's see uh, the number nine for our friends in Canada, BCE.TO, uh, BCE Incorporated. This is another one where uh, it looks like a breakout, but let's see how it closes and whether or not it holds on the close. If I was trading this, I would probably trade this as a breakout and simply exit if it doesn't hold it. So I could manage my risk to the downside because with this PPO looking like it's going to cross, volume starting to pick back up again on this rally, I think there's a decent chance we'll make another run back up at about 55 and a quarter to 55 and a half. So I could maybe have a couple dollars upside with only maybe 40, 50 cents downside. So I like the reward to risk on this one. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of trading right now, I'll be honest. I'm a little nervous about the market, but this one looks pretty good to me at this point. Okay, we have uh, a medical equipment industry uh, symbol, V-I-V-E. -E. I'll let you pronounce that. I'm not sure I do it right. Oh, Vivi, Vivi. Vivi, Vivi. Um, yeah, this is one I'm not very familiar with either. Um, and you can see the volume uh, is not huge. So that bothers me a little bit. And um, I'm going to take a, just a little bit longer view. Let's just go back a year on this one and see if there's a prior. Yeah, the prior trend was down. We bounced. Um, I think that we're right now just mired in a fairly wide trading range created from the huge sell off that we saw back in uh, May to uh, kind of maybe capitulate all the selling that we saw previous. And then there's your reaction high all the way back up right here to about 420. So that's a pretty wide range. And we just kind of keep meandering back and forth. I don't think I would buy it here just because of how do I manage my risk? Uh, I guess I could use the 20 day moving average, but even that, you know, you might have maybe a two to one reward to risk ratio or something. I don't like it at this point. I think there's too much back and forth. The volume trends have been mostly lower I would just watch it for now. All right. Okay. And the last one, actually, that was the last one. <laughs> that was number 10. So let's go ahead and we'll take a peek at what we did look at. Here are the symbols. I will have those up in the Market Watchers Live blog area there. So you can go to the Market Watchers Live chart list and click on it, and you'll get all of these charts that Tom just annotated for you. All right, time for our final market update. Let's see what has been going on in the market while we've been so busy here. 
All right. You know, we opened up earlier on the day, but we have been pulling back ever since. Currently, the Dow, S&P 500, S&P 100, they are still in positive territory, but just barely. Uh, we'll have to see if they follow suit with the NASDAQ, which is now in negative territory. And we can see S&P 400, small caps, all suffering and back into negative territory. Looks like it's pretty much continuing that declining trend we're seeing on the 400 and the Russell 2000. TSX, big gap up, uh, continued higher is pulling back, but still up over 108 points. TNX, treasury yields are up right now, reading 3.192%. UUP, slowly uh, moving lower. Uh, in a, in a, a declining trend. Uh, we'll have to see if that continues. Uh, with gold right now, we've got a big gap up and then it is consolidating sideways. And I do have some information to talk to you about on gold during sentiment. TLT uh, in the negative, down 10 cents, currently reading 113.86. And USO, gap up and consolidating sideways, looks a little bit like uh, gold. Uh, today. So uh, USO is up almost 1% and it's reading right now at 1470. And that's all I have for the final market update. Passing it back to you, Tom. Sounds good. Just want to make a, just take a quick look. I think this was a question that came up in the room, the XLY colon XLP. Um, it has definitely been falling apart and it was one of the, the big problems I saw today in the market, along with the fact that the utilities are, are outperforming transports on a day when the market was trying to go higher and I didn't like that. That is that doesn't make me feel very good about a rally. Now, short term, yes, this is a problem. Long term, because it's going down, do I think that's a bear market? No. I think that uh, any just like any stock that goes up wildly, it's okay to come back down for a while. And I think this is likely going to um, uh, coincide with market consolidation. We saw this back in 2016. This scared the bejeebers out of me, I'll be honest, when we actually broke down to a two or two and a half year low back then, because as you see, you go up, you have a higher high, higher low, higher highs, and then here it was a higher low. We broke out and then came back down below that level. It turned out just to be a head fake. But I think, and I said this before, I wouldn't be shocked if we got down to 170 or 180 on this ratio if we consolidate. So I'm not using this yet as an excuse for the market or uh, as a, um, a reason to get overly bearish. But I do think that when, whenever you see the market trying to go higher and this ratio dropping, it does make me a little nervous. So short term, I'm turning more bearish. And by the way, next week, and maybe we can talk about this if we have any time at the end, but next week is the most bearish historical week of the year for U.S. equities across all of the major indices. So hmm. timing there, uh, not great with everything else going on in the market. Yes. And we have had people asking about your your thoughts on on October and how it's shaping up. So uh, I'm sure you'll be talking about that more, especially when we get to seasonality at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so let's go ahead and get started on the decision point uh, sentiment update. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us going on that. Okay, here we go, excellent. We are now ready to proceed. All right, so today, uh, this is the decision point sentiment update for October 19th, Friday. And what I'm gonna do is go through what uh, we're looking at as far as the put call ratio. I like to look at the polls uh, at the American Association of Individual Investors in particular. Uh, we'll be looking at name, uh, the right X ratio, which is our own uh, sentiment indicator. I think is very powerful. I'll talk to you a little bit about the VIX, and then I am gonna finish up with some information on what I'm seeing in gold and gold sentiment. Uh, so before I begin to look at charts, just a reminder to anybody who's new to sentiment, uh, sentiment is a contrarian indicator, meaning if you have an excess of bulls, uh, typically you're gonna see a downside reversal. If you have an excess of bears, that's when you wanna look for the reversal to the upside. So we're gonna look at the sentiment and, and see what it's saying and what it could be telling us for next week. All right, so I'm gonna start with the put call ratio. I have inverted the scale just so I can look at it as far as oversold and overbought. 
um, meaning when it's very low, when the number gets lower, that I consider overbought because that means that people are, uh, that we have a preponderance uh, on, the, on the positive side, on the call side of the ratio. Uh, so that's why I use the inverted scale. But what we're looking at right now is very oversold readings and they are still coming down. Uh, so I, I find that to be um, not great news. Uh, I think the fact that, the, that it is starting to get into that oversold area, um, that that's a good thing, but we have certainly seen it move lower and it certainly could move lower. We're seeing a lot of bearishness still in um, the market right now. And obviously put call ratio is still reflecting a lot of bearishness, um, but I, it's not over yet <laughs> at this point. We're still seeing a decline. Uh, what we want to see is that bottom, and it just hasn't come in yet. Uh, so something to consider. All right, here is the AAII sentiment chart. This is the poll, and I believe if you go to AAII.org, you can you too can take the poll. Uh, what I wanted to point out, really, it's it's not an exciting chart this week, I, I will admit. Uh, we do see that, I'm going to direct you to the thumbnail, we had a slight decrease in the bears here uh, and a slight increase in bulls. But as you can see, uh, if you know if you add these up, we're, we're really looking at a third of the responses almost uh, that are neutral, that really aren't sure. And we have almost an even amount of bulls and bears. So the ratio right now is very close to one, um, meaning it's about as neutral as you can get right now. So I don't, uh, I, I have to say that this particular chart, uh, AAII, is showing uh, mixed sentiment. Uh, so I would look at this as a neutral uh, at this point as far as the polling goes, how people are feeling when they take a poll. Uh, it's interesting because I know we've all been talking about how bearish uh, everybody is, but interestingly, you know, when, when we got the results of this poll yesterday, uh, there weren't as many bears out there as I thought there would be. So I think that that uh, really speaks to the fact that we could see uh, lower prices because, you know, at least in the polling data, we just don't see, uh, I'm not seeing enough bears out there to consider it, uh, you know, to look for that reversal. All right, this is the name exposure index. And remember this is the National Association of Active Investment Managers. So they report how exposed they are to the market, whether to the upside or short, uh, et cetera. So right now uh, the exposure index is under 70. Uh, we did, if you look in that thumbnail, oh, let's go back, go back. There we go. If you look in that thumbnail over here, you can see we had quite an increase in exposure, which I thought was interesting um, as far as this week is concerned. So it does seem like uh, these active managers were buying into this uh, you know, upside move that we have had, but they're still very cautious uh, because we're not seeing the kind of exposure we saw during the uh, rally to the upside. And you know you really want to see it pull back quite a bit before you start getting worried. Uh, you can see back here um, in now it looks like well it was the end uh, the last quarter of 2017. You know we had that giant run to the upside obviously, um, but we did get the these really nice uh, low readings as a possible uh, indication that we might be looking at. Um, some, uh, you know, there was a lot of bearishness starting to appear as people started to pull back exposure during an uptrend. And that told us that, uh, you know, uh, we did end up getting that big spike, of course, to the upside, but it could have been uh, a, a pretty good precursor to when we had that big decline. Um, you know, we had, we didn't get that good a warning, I would say, as far as exposure was concerned. Uh, for this last downdraft that we had. But what I wanted to mainly point out with this chart is that we are seeing an increase in exposure. It's just not what I would call uh, an extreme. So again, I feel like this is more of a neutral uh, to bearish chart. Um, neutral in that the, you know, the reading is sort of in the middle here. Um, bearish just because we're not getting those high, high readings yet. 
um, that I would expect from these guys uh, to get really exposed. Um, that would make it especially bearish. Uh, at this point, I think it's only just a little bit bearish that they're um, moving their exposure because they're, that means they're feeling bullish. Um, but more than likely, I think they're just smart and they've been buying into this, uh, cautiously buying into this uh, move to the upside we've had this week, uh, but they're not buying into it that much. So that gives me a little bit of concern and worry there. Oh, I did want to point out one other thing on that chart. Let's go back, whoops, wrong way. Okay, I did have this whole this big orange rectangle uh, out here, <laughs> so I should explain why I have it there. Uh, you know, we have readings right here, like I said, right between like 65 and 70. And I noticed there was a point in time where we had uh, similar readings where we had cautious, uh, you know, cautious exposure. Um, yet elevated exposure. And it's right about the same readings. And, and that was really during a, a point of choppiness and indecision. You know, we did have a little bit of a downside move there uh, coming out. Um, but I suspect this is what we're going to be looking at. If we, can if we continue to see the big guys um, exposed, but cautiously exposed, uh, I think that's going to mean some more chop. All right, this is the Ridex uh, assets uh, analysis chart. Uh, decision Point came up with this, and I think it's uh, a fabulous Decision Point really being Carl at the time came up with this. Uh, so what we do is we look at a basket of funds. Uh, they are now managed by Guggenheim, but they used to be managed by a company called Ridex. Uh, we've just maintained the name just because of course, the right X ratio that's familiar to us, that's what we call it. So we've left the name. It's the same funds, but like I said, they're managed uh, by Guggenheim. And what we do is we look at a, a group of those funds, bear funds, uh, money market funds, and then the bull and sector funds. And by watching where the cash is, where the assets are, that gives us a sense of what Partic market participants participants are actually doing with their money. So it's not a poll. It's not a finger in the wind where you know I can say, yeah, I'm feeling really bearish, and then I go out and buy a couple stocks. You know, I'm, I, not that I do that, but uh, that's to you know you can f have that happen with polls. It's really easy uh, to just say uh, I'm I I'm I'm bullish or I'm bearish. Uh, so I think it's more important to know where the actual money is going, where the money is being invested and how, how it's being looked at. So a few things I'm gonna point out on uh, the chart. We're gonna start down here and then I'll move back up here to that ratio. So first of all, assets uh, in the bear funds clearly rising and ha actually have been since you know the beginning of October. And as far as this week is concerned, we're still seeing a rise. Um, last week, we did get a little bit of a decline, you can see, uh, but overall for that week, it was still up. Uh, right now, we're seeing uh, for this week, it's, it is moving up. Money market funds uh, in general are moving up uh, since mid-October here. And as for the week, I took a look at it and it, and it did technically rise as well. Uh, and then when we look at the equity and bull sector funds, it's pretty much flat. Um, you know, we're not seeing an increase in the assets there, uh, but we're not seeing a, a huge decrease either. Uh, but it is sitting, uh, the assets are sitting pretty much at, uh, you know, near term lows as far as the equities, uh, the equity bull sector funds are concerned, but we know that they can go lower. Uh, but the main thing I wanted to point out is the fact that, you know, this is showing you that as far as market participation is concerned, that people are very bearish uh, and are continuing to now be bearish. Now, generally, like I said, uh, we have a contrarian indicator here. So when people are very bearish, that is bullish for the market. Um, I believe that that is also the case here. I think it is bullish for the market, but um, I don't uh, see it as bullish yet for the intermediate term market. I would look at this as a possible short term uh, setup for us. But uh, again, when we look, we are at highs here for uh, bull or bear fund assets, but we've seen more. So I, I still feel like we have the opportunity here to get even more bearish. Um, and, and that's what I'd like to see. Uh, the bull bear ratio is continuing to fall. Uh, that means that we are seeing more and more activity on the 
on the bearish side. And uh, we want to see that ratio continue lower. Uh, at, you know, if we weren't sitting here right after this huge decline, I would be probably trumpeting, oh my goodness, everybody's so bearish, it's time for a big uh, reversal. But given the weakness and where the strength is in the market, as we've been talking about, I'm not, uh, I, I think we could see even more bearish activity here uh, before we need, uh, before we should look for upside. All right, gold, this is my last chart. Uh, well, one of the last charts. I'm very, uh, I'm actually quite bullish on gold right now. And here's why. Uh, I have an intermediate term trend model buy signal that will trigger today. I'm sure Carl will be writing about this in the Decision Point weekly wrap. So just go to the Decision Point blog for Friday, October 18th. Uh, I see a flag formation here. Uh, I see a rising PMO, momentum is doing well. And this is what I think is the most important. Right now, uh, on a short-term basis, this is a 20-day um, average of the correlation between gold and the dollar. And right now, uh, it is in positive territory. That means, you know, when it is, when it's at zero, that means the gold and, and the dollar have really nothing to do with each other with their movement. There's no dependence one, one way or the other. There's no uh, relationship. And right now, when we start moving to that uh, positive territory, that tells you that they, could, they can actually travel together. So, you know, I am still bullish on the dollar, uh, but I think it's at this point, you can be bullish on both. Uh, I wanted to point out the sentiment. We had very bearish sentiment before this pop, and now it is pulling back as far as the discount levels go. Uh, one of the things I mentioned yesterday is that Kitco is showing uh, the movement on gold is predominantly based on buyers and not on what's happening to the dollar. And I think you can see that right there. Okay, I'm going the wrong way, let's go. <laughs> All right. Last chart real quick, VIX, uh, I think is still looking rather bearish. Uh, we're underneath the moving average. Typically when you're trading under the moving average, you're gonna see a lot of uh, chop. Um, you know, we got the pop and the rally, but I, I, I'm waiting to see, um, I wouldn't be looking for huge upside movement till we end up uh, moving back down below that lower Bollinger Band. That pretty much completes the sentiment update. Here is the uh, conclusion. Uh, so basically, I think put call ratio is, is moving bullish for the market. AAII is really neutral, uh, given that bull bear ratio being around one. I think there's a healthy increase in the exposure for name, but it's not extreme enough for me to, um, you know, to really see a, a bullishness as far as they're concerned, that the caution that is uh, looking, that is there, I would look at it as neutral to bearish. I'm still looking for some chop, uh, and I suspect they are too, which is why they're not as ex as exposed. Right X ratio, uh, still they're very, it's a, a bearish setup. Uh, it is bullish for the market, but I still think we could get even more bearish as far as that. Uh, breadth in the VIX, like I said, uh, high volatility. Um, it's not a time to be in. I would look at it as a neutral to bearish. And finally, gold sentiment, like I said, discounts backing up, uh, backing off. We have a bull flag. And like I said, I'm seeing on kitco.com uh, predominance of buyers versus um, movement in gold based on the dollar. And that's all I have for the sentiment update. Um, I guess we should pull up that poll and see what everybody else is thinking as we close out the show here. Uh, what are you thinking? I, I actually did vote lower. I don't think we're done yet. And I think this little pop we had uh, as far as rally uh, is, is um, falling. I, I don't think we're going to get much more out of it. I'm going lower. I think tacticals are pointing lower. I don't like the action today. And Historically, the S&P 500 has lost uh, on an annualized return. It's lost 41.24% from October 22nd to October 20, 22nd through the 27th over the last 68 years. The yeah. NASDAQ since 1971 minus 65% and the Russell 2000 since 1987 minus 47%. So anyhow, next week, not good historically. No. <laughs> There's your upcoming schedule. I do want to thank everybody for being with us today. Please remember to complete this survey as you exit. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Friday afternoon, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Be safe, and hopefully we'll see you back here on Monday.
Happy trading. 